Hello and welcome back to Scandi Pitches. Scandi singers talk singing. And as usual, I've got Therese with me. How are you doing today, Therese? I'm doing very well, thank you. Yeah. Um, I still haven't mastered my wave, which I really want to sort of fit in this part of the screen. But every time I do it, I just do it with this hand automatically. <laughs> does it feel more natural? A, well, yeah, it does feel more natural somehow. Um, because I think, I don't know, I think I see myself obviously as if it's in a mirror and then I'm doing it the wrong way. What's your dominant hand? Well, it's the right hand usually, so this should feel more natural. But okay, but because, in this case, it doesn't. Yeah, but because I don't actually see myself as in a mirror, I see myself, well, reverse. Oh, well. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to hear that you're keeping yourself busy thinking about important things, like which hand you're waving with. Yeah, you know, <laughs> that's clearly the most crucial part of these chats. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The more, the more astute viewer might notice that I'm in a different room than usual, but I'm not. I in, know. Yeah, I'm not actually in Norway, though I'll be going there in a bit. This is my, uh, what is usually my bedroom, but I swapped them around um, because it gets so boiling hot in London during the summers. And this room is actually on the, the morning sun side. And so for years I've woken up with a, with a massive headache during the summers because it's just cooking in there. Oof, so. yeah. It's a little bit nicer to have it on the opposite side where there is, uh, you know, no morning sun. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> anyway, that's a digression because we have a musical topic to talk about. And today we are talking about vibrato. Vibrato! Ooh. And um, vibrato, and now we talked about support last time, which we would consider a contentious topic. Vibrato, I think, is even more of a contentious topic because every, like, Everyone has an opinion about vibrato. Yeah, not I everyone... think, I mean, Go on. it's, uh, sorry, it's not as contentious, I suppose, as like people, there's a, there's a more general consensus of what vibrato is, yeah, I suppose. True. But then the contention is like how to use it, when to use it. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think, uh, well, yeah, with support, it was an issue of definition, whereas with vibrato, it's a, more, it's a, a taste thing as well. Okay, so vibrato, for those who don't know, vibrato is an oscillation of pitch, which is uh, usually considered to be within the confines of a semitone, but it doesn't have to be. It could be wider, it could be smaller, uh, but essentially you're taking a note and shaking it up and down like it's Vibrating a it. Yeah, you're vibrating it. Vi vi vibrato. Vibrare, <laughs> vibrato. <laughs> yeah, again, it comes from Italian. A lot of Indeed. music words do. Yes. Um, now, why do we do vibrato? Why is that a thing that we do? Sometimes we can't stop ourselves. <laughs> I suppose. I, mean, I suppose. I mean, there you just is... feel the spirit, and you just have to. <laughs> <laughs> and you just have to vibrate. But no, I mean, obviously, like there are like vibrato can be natural, and it can be forced, uh, or not forced, but um, mm -hmm. but intentional. Um, so I think. I mean, it's. Um, it's obviously like something that we can, we can both produce it and let it happen naturally and we mm -hmm. can contain it. Yeah. To different degrees. I know I that guess. people often confuse vibrato with tremolo, which is when you mm -hmm. have an oscillation in the volume rather than the pitch. Mm -hmm. And that's, so if you listen to say a Wurlitzer keyboard, that has like a vibrating kind of effect on it. And that's in fact yeah. not vibrato, that is tremolo so the volume is literally going up and down and creating that mm. vibrating effect um yeah. <laughs> but yeah with singing we will consider it to be with the pitch now how do you when did you first learn vibrato do you remember yes i do actually oh. <laughs> uh i well as an i learned that i was producing a vibrato um unconsciously um mm -hmm. i was eight uh and i was going to sing a solo in a school concert and I had um, I had like a practice with um, the music teacher who was going to accompany on the guitar um, and I sang through the song um, and he 
was like, oh, you can you can do a vibrato. Um, <laughs> and then I was like, hey, eh? um, and he said, oh, I can't do it, but I can show you on the guitar what I mean. Mm-hmm. And he, you know, <laughs> did uh, did a vibrato on his guitar. Okay. Um, and that's when I learned what it was and sort of realized that, yeah, I had been, you know, I had a natural vibrato sometimes yeah. when singing, not, you know throughout sustained notes when I suppose it happens the most. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because I also picked up vibrato um, kind of naturally without aiming for it. It, Mm. uh, As I was practicing, this was back when when I I was a really bad singer, but the one thing that I could do was I could do vibrato. And I Mm. uh, I actually, and I can still actually control it quite quite well like I can make it really small mm. or really wide and for some reason it just it was something that I was able to do and I don't really know how I got it but I did and it's yeah. um, um I have been wondering if it is something that people have been developing from the beginning of time or if it's something that we develop develop because we hear other singers do it and we then yeah. copy it and uh you know I suspect it might be kind of a combination of the two yeah um yeah probably because i think it's uh especially if if you're listening a lot to styles where vibrato is quite prominent then you might just adopt it Mm -hmm. and start doing it and i think like to probably in the song i was singing when i was eight um i'm sure that was yeah i do it was um esmeralda's prayer from um the Hunchback of Notre Dame. I know it. I would sing it, but then we get a copyright claim, so I'm not going <laughs> to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I would as well. But I think everybody hears the melody in their heads. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, def- definitely, like, there are there are some nice long notes in there um, that definitely kind of lend themselves to a vibrato. Yeah. Um, so... I'm going to say that's what I, what I was doing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think you will, pop musicians, uh, so pop singers will generally sing with vibrato. Now they might use it more mm. or less, but it is a style where we do use it. Yeah. Now, we've looked at vibrato in detail already, but we were looking at group singing and how it affects ensemble when singing together. Because and it, and it is definitely a situation where I think you need to think about whether you're using vibrato or not. Because if yes. you're singing with uh, a bunch of people and you're trying to create a unified sound, then different approaches to vibrato will have an effect because mm. you're literally fluctuating your pitch. And of course, when you're singing together, you want to create almost like a unified pitch. Um, and I think we also found that it group size will have an effect because you know the more voices you put on top of each other... Yeah the smaller the effect of the vibrato will be. but Definitely. Um, yeah, when we're singing together as choir singers, then I think, I think we often, well, I know uh, I will try to kind of rein it back quite a bit. Yeah. And just be as precise as I can, just because I'm, I'm a perfectionist and I, we often end up singing in quite small groups. And so I kind of be like, okay, well, I'm not going to yeah. just like, because I, I, I have to confess, I love to sing with vibrato. I think it's, it's so, <laughs> it's so nice. Um, mm. But when I'm trying to kind of slot in with loads of singers, then I'll kind of rein it back because one thing that vibrato does have a ten- tendency to do is it tends to make your voice kind of stand out a bit more. Yes. And that's definitely quite evident when you're just two or three to a part. <laughs> yeah. If, um, if one person is using vibrato and another one isn't, mm-hmm. you're going to hear it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's, um, yeah, but obviously, like, it's, um, it can be a great effect as well. Like, if it is a group of singers and everybody is um, using vibrato, yeah. depending on genre, that could be quite exciting. Um like I mean, I still, I still always, uh, always cherish the instruction we got once for a singing gig to do an to do an Ennio Morricone vibrato. <laughs> <laughs> like just because that's so joyful and yeah. uh, and it can be so fun. And uh, I think, like, in terms of connotations, like vibrato, I think has a lot of connotations with 
passion mm-hmm. and um, like passionate singing, especially because of how prominent it is in opera. Yeah. Like I don't think you there there wouldn't really be opera without vibrato. It's <laughs> almost it's almost impossible when you're using your voice in that way to not um, to not occasionally have a, a natural vibrato. Um, yeah, it's interesting you bring up opera because that was kind of going to be my next thing, the next oh, point of the points in the agenda. <laughs> no, but that's good. It's a good, good segue, you know. Hey. <laughs> um, because you know, as as I mentioned, it is a bit of a contentious topic, and part of the problem is that we don't really know to what extent people use vibrato in the past. Um, why might that be? What's the problem we have when it, when it comes to talking about music from the past? Uh, could it be that there are no recordings? There are no recordings. Absolutely. There are no recordings. <laughs> and so we have no idea. Now, people did, you know, of course, there were singing instructors and they might have written very, very detailed notes. Problem is that, and again, this I think is similar to the problem we have when we talk about support. They would have had different opinions about what vibrato is. They would have described it more. And again, with with stuff in the arts, there tends to be a bit of an aesthetic bias. So they'll say like, this sounds good. This does not sound good. And Mm -hmm. of course, the the implication there is, I think this sounds good. I think this doesn't sound good. And that is a problem when you look at old sources when it comes to stuff like vibrato. So they could say Mm -hmm. like, oh, you should avoid having a wide ring in vibrato. But then what constituted a wide ring and vibrato for them it's hard to say because we don't know exactly what kind of singing they were listening to no but from the early you know late 19th century onwards we do get audio recordings and then we hear and i was looking up different recordings of old opera singers and they definitely they they vibe it up to put it that way it's uh, yeah. vibrato now i have a theory about why opera singers use really really heavy vibrato but maybe you will know what i'm talking about so why do opera singers sing with really wide vibrato you think no you tell me your theory <laughs> uh, i i kind of i tend to describe it almost a bit sarcastically but you know if if you're a singer and you're competing with 10 trumpets to be heard then you have to just use every single tool in your toolbox so there's, there's definitely so over the development of classical music orchestras just got bigger and bigger and bigger you look at the baroque and it was like what one to a part string quartet and maybe like two horns and that was it that was whole orchestra and then Mm. you get to beethoven and it's like 50 60 70 piece orchestra and then um my pet eight (laughs) wagner wagner who invented his own brass because he didn't think that the the existing brass was like good enough for him now the problem Mm -hmm. with brass instruments i mean the thing that makes brass instruments great and simultaneously make them really annoying when you're a singer is that they're so loud and so twangy yeah yeah if so and because wagner did use you know use brass very extensively if you were going to sing wagner's music you you had to just knock it out of the park there was no other option there was no room for subtlety well of course you you know (laughs) It depends on the movement, of course, but like if you wanted to, to sing the big, the big Wagnerian roles, you had to, you know, be able to sing extremely, extremely loudly and with a clearly ringing voice. And what's, and again, this is why vibrato is so great because it helps you stand out. It's if you're singing with straight tone, you do blend in more with the surrounding sounds. Whereas with a vibrato, you will stand out and you will carry and you will sing all the way to the back seat. Mm. And, and I think that's, most likely the reason why vibrato became such a big deal was because before microphones, what were you going to do if you were singing for, uh, you know, 10,000 people in a big, in a big opera house? Hmm. Maybe but not also 10, I'm wondering, I'm wondering though, if it's like, I'm not sure it's always like a conscious decision to use vibrato. Um, I think vibrato when singing with operatic technique and, and, and and building your instrument in that way Mm -hmm. um it's it's a side effect as well of using your voice in a certain way and expanding on your voice and really like because you need a big voice to sing opera Mm -hmm. which obviously everyone knows um and then when you train in that way for a certain amount of time you build in a a natural vibrato and Mm. it's uh 
and it's like once you're a trained opera singer it's really it's really hard to rein that back um mm-hmm. and bring it back because you just train your voice to be loud enough and big enough and as you say resonant enough to project over an orchestra mm-hmm. um so it's it's tricky because it's a, it just um and it was for me it was one of the main reasons i um like went back on opera um because mm-hmm. i was gonna i was accepted in an opera school in sweden and i was gonna go and do that and um you were gonna <laughs> be a big and, prima donna weren't you well you know i'm still a big prima donna <laughs> <laughs> so nothing changed but uh but no and then i went and did like you know pop music in london instead and it was like it was the for me it really was the sort of fear of not um of not so easily fluctuating between genres because mm-hmm. I've never been, I've never had a genre that's like mine. Like the variety um, is what I love most about singing and getting to sing different things and using my voice in different ways. Um, so training for many years to essentially, um, like obviously it doesn't happen to everyone. So I'm not like, uh, apologies for generalizing, but um but I do, I do know it is quite difficult to, to do other genres justice sometimes if you have a very operatic sound. Yeah, I'm reminded of that concert we did. We don't have to say who it was, but it was a classical singer. That we went to, yeah. yeah excellent classical singer. She, yeah. she was amazing. Uh, I mean, she was even ill on that day and she had an astounding voice. Like it was amazing. Was then, fantastic. To, but then when she finished up, she was like, I'm going to have some fun now. I'm going to do show tunes. And yeah. my, my classical piano accompanist is going to play jazz accompaniment to me. And it's, uh, it's fun that they, they tried, but it sounded all wrong. It, yeah, it did. It was just, and it was also like that sort of, because I'm all for like, you know, mm. blending genres and, um, and using, let's say like non-traditional sounds in new mm. ways um, or using traditional sounds in ways where you don't expect it um Mm. but it's just like when it's done without without irony (laughs) i suppose or like without a sort of recognition of the fact that it's something different um then it it does as you say it can just sound really wrong and Mm. the risk as well like sometimes when when um opera singers um do um like say show tunes or pop music and do sort of serious renditions as it were Mm -hmm. um it it can really sound quite parodic (laughs) without (laughs) that without that being the intention i Mm -hmm. absolutely love it when that is the intention because it can be so hilarious um but when it's but when it's not it's a shame because it doesn't do this amazing singer justice and it doesn't Mm -hmm. do the song justice um so I think it's really like it's always worth thinking about like what is the actual appropriate way to interpret a song and what mm-hmm. sound fits. And of yeah. course everyone should have fun and everyone should sing everything mm-hmm. always, but it's like it's worth thinking about when you're doing it in public, I I guess. Uh, <laughs> do, it, do it in your in your in your bathroom, that's fine. Keep it off my stage, please. <laughs> no, no, not like that. But like just like everything like just putting a bit of context to something as well uh, can be good. But I think there is a sort of, I think a lot of the time um, there is a little bit of a hierarchy in terms of like, you know, there, there is the expectation that opera singers are the best singers that mm-hmm. exist. And, you know, opera singers are certainly the most, a lot of the time anyway, like the most trained singers in terms of like, um, the specific dedication that goes into training that instrument. But I mean, there it's not just opera singers who have that kind of extensive training. It's just that it's very mm-hmm. audible that they have had training. Yeah. And I think a lot of the time people don't necessarily hear that someone's voice is trained if, if they're singing in a way that kind of replicates speech, like yeah. a lot of musical theater singers, for example, or, or singers who are a bit more speech songy, mm-hmm. um, or whatever it may be. Yeah. And of course, you know, opera singing is an aesthetic and it has certain, you know, it has certain um, things that 
separate the way it sounds from the way other kinds of singing sounds. And the way they use vibrato is going to be different because in musical theatre, there is a more preference for maybe starting a note with straight tone and then increasing vibrato towards the end. Am I mm-hmm. interpreting this correctly? <laughs> uh, I suppose. I mean, if, if we're talking generally, probably. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, I'm going to, you know, just state for the record here that I am by no means uh, an expert on opera or musical theatre singing. This is not my Eric's. <laughs> area of expertise expectise as i said in the (laughs) in the first recordings um but yeah but it's vibrato does inform style and for certain genres it's more kind of you're more used to hearing people singing with vibrato and so that makes sense for others people use it less so for instance in um in jazz singing you get a mix of it actually but in bossa nova people tend to sing without vibrato and that has just for some reason become a defining characteristic of singing in that style. I don't know why, but also, Mm. you know, I didn't invent it. This is just me observing, okay, this is what's going on. I'm sure there's loads of exceptions, but um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's an, it's a feature of singing that informs the aesthetic. And um, that might also be part of the problem when you hear someone, you know, someone who sings with uh, an operatic tone singing, I don't know, hip hop music. It can it, it, well. That's that would be epic. most certainly going to sound funny, but it's going to have that kind of weird. Um, uh, oh, there's a great word for this. Um, there's going to be cognitive dissonance. Mm-hmm. Something's yeah. not going to be quite right about it because it doesn't. That's mm. that's kind of taking from different established styles and putting them together. Yeah. And I too think it's great to mix stuff together, but you've got to be very careful in how you do it. Yeah, and do it intentionally as well. Like do it with yeah. a purpose. And if you're going to, and not just by accident, which I think <laughs> is the thing. Like you, you can hear when it's unintentionally, cognitively dissonant. <laughs> I think, and that's that's when it's a bit off-putting because it's just yeah. a sort of like, then then that is when I think it can, if you're going to be really extreme, which I am, <laughs> <laughs> that's when it can almost feel like a bit of like disrespect for um yeah. for everyone involved maybe yeah and um, we have to remember but, that you know people write music and they will have things in mind and that's the the, the composer's yeah. intention and you know it's the same for for people who write pop music you know they'll have a certain intention in mind with singing the way it's supposed to be sung and mm-hmm. if you choose to go against that then you know you might do so consciously but you might you know be you might be going against the composer's wishes <laughs> mm. and of course that's going to then make the music sound very different mm. really interesting though that like you know when working with um new material um just drawing the parallel between like stage writing and writing plays and mm-hmm. and things like that and for that matter like films and screenplays um and like the level of control that the composer often has on the final final product i think is quite quite a lot higher than the sort of than um a playwright giving over a script to production mm-hmm. like the, it's kind of understood that a lot of the time the the production and the company they will they will do what they will with it and that's mm-hmm. part of the excitement to a degree and i mean most of the time people are interested in the writer's intentions but they're not deciding factors whereas i think a lot of the time in music people are very keen to live up to the composer's wishes when interpreting a new work would you say yeah. well i mean we're still trying to do it with old music like historically informed performance is its own almost mm-hmm. like genre of performance people are like we have to make it sure it sounds exactly the way it sounded 400 years ago <laughs> so yeah. you know it is something that people definitely strive towards in music mm. We've kind of gone way off topic. We have, but that was fun. <laughs> but it's interesting. But of course, the, this it's not um, it's not strange that we did because this is the kind of mm. discussion that people talking about vibrato might get into. They'll talk about yeah. should should it be here? Is this you know part of the style? Is this part of the work? Is this mm. appropriate? And that's also probably why it's so contentious because if you listen to someone doing say historically informed performance. There will be people that will have massive, they'll take massive issue with this if the singer uses vibrato, even though there is no way they can know whether that was what the composer intended or not, because composers 
didn't tend to write in that kind of information. You mm-hmm. look at old schools and there's so much stuff that's just understood from the way music was performed back then, which is now lost because we mm. we are you you know we grew up with very different music. So yeah, it will bring up these kinds of discussions. Um, and uh, you know it goes a long way to, to just to show that vibrato, which is really cons- all things considered, a quite simpler concept really. It's just you you oscillate the pitch. That's all it is. And mm. then there's all these big topics that spring out of it. But that's yeah. also probably why it's so interesting. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Easy to digress in the same way it's easy to go off pitch with vibrato. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I will make a confession here. When I started out, I was really good at vibrato, but not everything else. So I would always use my vibrato <laughs> to mask the fact that I was singing completely the wrong note. <laughs> Absolutely. Love it. Yeah, Such yeah. a good method. <laughs> Yeah, I've stopped doing that, <laughs> but yeah, it's, yeah, it kind, of, it's kind of embarrassing looking back. Like, oh, I can't believe I just. Oh. Anyway, uh, there you go. <laughs> I think we might just call it here. So, just to summarize, yeah. vibrato is an oscillation of pitch. It's contentious, and when people talk about it, they tend to get really hung up on details about the uh, the, the composer's intention and what should be here and what should be here. And I think this, and I think that, and. Uh, if you want to know more about how it affects group singing, then I made a whole video about it. Well, we, you were also very actively involved, um, which you can check out and I'll link to it below um, so you can hear how it affects group singing. Um, yeah, that's uh, it for today's episode, I think. So thank you again so. very much for joining us for another episode of Scandi Pitches. Be sure to share this episode with your friends if you think they'll find it interesting. Uh, share if you have very strong opinions about vibrato, which everyone does, then be sure <laughs> to share them with us in the comment section below. Um, it'll be interesting to hear maybe how it's like in other music cultures. Uh, mm. That's uh, especially good for us Westerners to be exposed to more, you know, more uh, music cultures from around the world. So you might have very different approaches to vibrato, which we don't know about. Also really interesting, obviously, to hear if someone has never heard of vibrato before and has learned something completely new from this. (laughs) Never heard of vibrato. Well, I mean, could be. Don't judge. (laughs) No, I'm not going to judge. I hadn't when I was eight. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, we shall see you in another week for another episode of Scandi Pitches.